with a name like Antonakis, you had to figure you're going to get a Christos Anesti, right? So that's it, Christos Anesti. Have you remembered what the, the lesson was already? What's that? Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, right? Well, Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti is truly. He, that's where the indeed comes from. In truth, he has risen. That's, that's why we say indeed in our greetings. Christos Anesti, Eknakron, Thanaton, Thanaton, Patisas, Ketis, and his name is Isoin Charisamonos. You all know what that means, right? <laughs> Christ is risen from the dead, and we sang it. I, I'm so glad to see that line in the hymn. Death trampling upon death. And he has freed the captives from the tombs. Christ has trampled upon death. I'm so grateful to be here. I know this is a, a family service. I know the elementary kids are with us. Uh, I have a quick quiz for the elementary kids, and if you get the answer right, I'm going to toss you a piece of candy, because I know you've been candy deprived, and so I want to so ask you, how many disciples were there? This is just for the elementary kids. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Good job. Okay. Um, how many days was Jesus in the tomb? Three days. Good job. What's the name of the disciple who betrayed Jesus? Who? Who said that? Nice. Watch out. <laughs> who was nicer to you this morning, mom or dad? No, I'm kidding. Don't answer that question. We'll keep doing that. Keep, keep, keep alert, kids, okay? You know, Christ has trampled upon death, but it's even more than that. If you can say something like that, if you can say that it's more than that, it's hard to even imagine saying that, that Christ has defeated death, has trampled death. But Christ has also done something to help us in the dying of this world, in the dying of this life. You know, when you ask people about the end of life, many times, you, maybe you've said this yourself, People say, you know, it's not so much death I'm afraid of, it's the dying. It's, and so Easter, our Easter hope is also about dealing with the dying aspects of life, all the disappointments, all the disillusionments, all the difficulties, all the despair. We can face all of life's struggles no matter what we're going through because of this day. And some of you here today may be going through those things. Some of you may be dealing with that. I mean, some of you may be in despair over your final four bracket. I don't want to trivialize anything. How many of you picked Kentucky? Pick Kentucky? Yeah, how many of you picked Wisconsin? You picked Wisconsin. Go, man. How many picked Duke? Anybody picked Duke for to, to win it all? Okay, all right. Here, let me throw you some candy. No, it's too, it's too early. It's too early. We don't know. It's Monday night, right? But on a more serious note, Ellen and I have been visiting a good friend uh, over the past few weeks who's dying of cancer. She's over in the acute care center at Oakcrest. She's asked me to do her funeral when the time comes, which of course I will do. She is so courageous. Hospice is near. Treatment has ended. Um, it's a slow type of thing. Her name's Dottie. Uh, she is a type A planner. And so every time we visit, or at least almost every time, we've gone over her funeral service. She wants to make sure it's exactly right. So there's draft 1.0, draft 2.0, draft 3.0. We've changed things. Psalm 118, she said, has been very important to me <clears throat> of late. We, we read Psalm 118 today. And so I said, okay, let's look at Psalm 118, Dottie. And we get to Psalm 118, verse 24, which we read today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And she looks at me and she goes, I don't think we should have that in that day of my funeral. Okay? So we're, la we're laughing with each other in the face of dying and death. I don't know how many people you know that really want to plan through and think through their, the details of their funeral. But that's what we were doing. We're laughing in the face of dying and death. 
But Mary Magdalene, who we read about today, announcing the empty tomb, uh, was not laughing on the dawn of that first Easter. In fact, when she came to the other disciples, she didn't say, the tomb is empty, he's risen. She said, they've taken, my, they've taken the Lord, and we do not know where they have laid him. She was fixated on death, not life. And she was filled with grief. She's mentioned, Mary is mentioned in all four gospel accounts of the resurrection. But in John's gospel, the author seems to zoom in on her grief and on her despair. And I think it's a beautiful thing that the one that Jesus first appeared to was struggling the most. And so the question becomes, what do you do when your world caves in? How do you deal with the difficulties, disappointments, disillusionments of life? And I want you to think about that as we, as we read the second half of John's gospel, uh, at least this section, verses 11 to 18, because this text points the way to answer that question of how do we deal with the dying of life as well as the death in life. So let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us today to lead us into truth. We ask that you would open our eyes that we might understand what you're saying to each of us. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Verse 11, John 20. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to, this, to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he said these things to her. Well, that's quite a difference from verse 1 to verse 18. I don't know what's going on. Do I have seen the Lord? Mary's first mentioned in Luke chapter 8. We don't know a whole lot about her. Her Magdalene just means where she's from, Magdala. And in Luke chapter 8, Verses 1 to 3 is the only, besides the resurrection accounts and besides her being near the cross, we don't know anything about her, but we do know this from Luke 8. When Jesus was going around proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom, the twelve were with him, as well, listen, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna and the wife of Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. So Mary Magdalene was a follower of Jesus from the beginning. She's kind of in the background, and she's in the background looking at the cross when he's dying. Jesus made a tremendous difference in her life, and she was a devoted follower. And early in, on Easter morning, she was crushed after following him for, for probably years. But that's until she encountered him in a new way. And in some ways, this Easter encounter that we've read about is, is like a lot of the, it's like the dynamics of many, many relationships. And I've done a good bit of premarital counseling and marital counseling in my ministry. And so I, one of the reasons we have this, I want to diagram for you something that I share with couples often um, and it sort of captures what was going on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, and and uh, if you were to go to a counselor, it might cost you $100 to $150 to get this information. 
So consider this like an Easter gift, okay, to you today, all right? All right, it's very simple. It's a very simple triangle. We're going to put an R up there. We're going to put a D here. We're going to put an L here and put a P here. I, I, I don't know if you all can see that or not, but that's, it's, that's it. That's the simple triangle. And I'm going to put a little starburst right, right here, okay? And I'll try to explain to you what I, what I mean when I talk about the dynamics of a relationship. The R stands for romance. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy. Oh my goodness, the thunderbolt strikes. Cupid's arrow hits. When I met Ellen, the first time I talked to her, I was, I was trying to hide it. But the thunderbolt had struck when I looked into her eyes. And I tried to, tried to be cool, and I just did not babble, right? And so uh, I couldn't think of anything else. I, we've talked about being lovesick. I, it was hard, hard to eat, right? You get giddy. You see, you see couples like this. They hang all over each other. It's, you know, you want to say, get out of here. Get, go away, right? Um, they, they, just, they just can't think about spending any minutes apart, let alone days, right? So that's, that's the romantic part. She's perfect. He's perfect. I can't imagine one flaw, all right? Upside down. That's, that's the romance stuff. Now, here's what happens. Anybody know what happens? <laughs> it doesn't last, okay? It doesn't last. So, so what happens, we start moving this way towards the D, and the D is disillusionment. Disill wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I didn't know that about him or her. I didn't know they believed that. I, boy, we really are different kind of thing. And at that point, I, a couple is faced with a crucial decision. They have to work through the pain of disillusionment and all that goes with it, or they take a detour to what I call Plasticville. Okay? And Plasticville is, you ever see those train gardens at Christmas time? Things look like they're kind of all together and everybody's looking, but it's artificial. It's not real. And they, and they live at a sort of a, a low-grade, unreal level, unless they work through the disillusionment. Because when they work through the disillusionment, here's what can happen. They can have a true encounter and then, you know what? They can meet the real person that they married, not their idealization of the person. And then, warts and all, when a person's known and still loved, then deepening, deepening, that's the L, deepening love takes place. And you know what happens after that? When you're accepted in love for who you really are, and you don't have to hide anymore, and, and all of that happens... you start to fall in love again. I've told Ellen many times, we're going to mar be married 42 years this October, uh, this August. Sorry, sorry, honey. <laughs> um, our son was born in October. Okay. Many times I've said to her in those 42 years, I'm, I'm falling in love with you again. I think she says that sometimes to me too. Full acceptance, warts and all, unconditional. That's what, that's what happens. But what's all that have to do with Easter? Well, the, the basis for romance begins with something called desire. And each person in this room has a longing for something to fill the void of life. That's what desire is. It's a longing for someone or something to fulfill our ache. The definition of the word desire is an expressly felt yearning for something that promises to fill a void. Bruce Springsteen once sang, everybody's got a, a hungry heart. And you see it all the time. It just pops up. We have Comcast as our server, our homepage, and it pops up all the time. And it says this, meet the right one. Not meeting the right people? You're not alone. Millions are finding love the modern way. Who's looking for you? 
Desire is a longing, it's a wishing. Uh, the Latin word for desire means to look to the stars. Interesting. Back in 1977, Voyager 1 and 2 was launched into space, looking, trying to contact anybody who's out there. And on, that, on those two spacecraft was put a golden record called Sounds of the Earth, five hours of human voices, animal noises, um, songs, music, and one of the pieces of music was Beethoven's Opus 130. And on the side of that piece of music, in German, he wrote the word longing. It's like the people who launched that spacecraft out there looking to the stars were asking the question of anybody who might hear this, do you have this same longing like we do? Do you look for fulfillment like we do? Blaise Pascal said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every human being that can't be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. And so Mary represents the top of the triangle on early Easter morning. When she first, when she first met Jesus, it was like, wow, this person has affirmed me. He's, he's changed my life. I'll never be the same. But then the cross and the tomb brings her down to a crushing sense of disillusionment. Her affirmer is gone. And it made her unable to register everything that was staring her in the face in this text. I mean, there is a list of things that just went right over her head, just real quickly. There's the empty tomb. There's the actions of Peter and John that she probably saw after they saw the empty tomb. She saw the grave clothes, which, by the way, points to the fact that there were no grave robbers. Grave robbers don't leave the grave clothes. Right? But that didn't register. There was the angels and the question, why are you weeping? Jesus himself with the same question. And then who are you looking for? Sounds like the match.com thing. But that's not the question. It's who's looking for you. The one who's raised from the dead is looking for you. You know, dis disillusionment goes way beyond couple relationships. There's all kinds of life disillusionments, church disillusionments, disappointments. Plasticville is filled with addictions and attachments and avoidance and affairs. Plasticville is a place you don't want to be. It's unreal. And it doesn't it doesn't change until what happens in verses 16 and 17. Let me read those to you again. In 16, Jesus finally says to her, Mary, and she turns and says to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. It's not till he calls her by name, now listen, and she turns and encounters him that she's lifted out of her disillusionment and starts to understand that she needs to move toward deepening love with who is now her heavenly father. And that little starburst, I don't know if you've ever heard of marriage encounter. Marriage encounter, if you've been on a marriage encounter weekend, they challenge you to do the hard work of communicating, of really getting to know your spouse on, an, on another level. And it usually goes way back to the stuff of childhood in terms of what keeps coming up in, in, into the relationship. And she still cling, she cling, the clinging and don't cling to me is John's way of saying the old ways of relating are gone. It's new. There's a deepening love possibility in personal relationship with, with the Heavenly Father through me. So all these Easter signs point us to the heart of Easter, personal encounter with Jesus, who deals with disappointments in life and who will ultimately deal with the question of death for each of the, everybody who believes in him. See, 
Salvation is deeply realizing that God proved his love for you and me when he went to that cross. Clearly proves his love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us so that you can know him personally. You know the most famous psalm? What's the most famous psalm? Kids, what's the most well-known psalm in the Bible? Kids, anybody? Anybody? Who said that? Who said 23? (laughs) Psalm 23 doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord is the shepherd. It says the Lord is my shepherd. It's a personal relationship. I have a good friend of mine who says that salvation is an 18-inch migration from the head to the heart. That's what salvation involves. Not just believing, but receiving from the heart. No amount of good works can ever make you right with your heavenly Father. Only Jesus' death and resurrection has done that, and we must enter into it. Let me give you my quick three-minute elevator testimony. In the fall of 1969, as a college student, I first heard the gospel through Billy Graham telecast in a college dormitory room. And I understood that I was being invited to turn and give my heart to Christ. But you know what my first reaction was? No way. Nobody's running my life but me. Can you believe that? I think there's a banner over hell that says that. Nobody's running my life but me. Fast forward another few months, good Greek Orthodox boy go to, goes to church. And that, that happens at midnight, by the way, in the Orthodox church. They go at midnight, they celebrate. The first minute of Sunday, the Orthodox people are celebrating the resurrection. And in this church where I didn't know anybody else, in Greenville, South Carolina, the lights go out, the candles go, just like we do Christmas Eve, Everybody starts singing, Christos Anesti and they start singing, Christ has risen from the dead, and the altar boys are moving around with the, the standards of Jesus, and, he's, and, I, and I'm in the front of the church, and I turn around like this, and here's Jesus coming towards me. And you know what happened then? I started weeping uncontrollably, and I didn't even know why. This question, like, why are you weeping? I was like, I don't know. I think, I think God is trying to do something. Fast forward another six months. I'm, I'm reading the Bible for uh, every night for about two nights, uh, two weeks when I'm working at the Towson Diner. My family started the Towson Diner. It's since been sold. And at 10.30 at night in the Towson Diner, nobody in the room, after reading the Bible for two nights, I finally make that 18-inch migration. I say to, say to the Lord, Lord, I don't, I don't even know the language to use, but right here and now, I give you my heart. Please help me to understand what it means to know you. And there have been many new encounters since then, but John 1, 12 makes it very clear. But to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. See, believe plus receive, become who God intended you to be. And you'll never be who God intended you to be without a deep relationship with his, with his son. And we become conquerors even in the face of death and dying. You know, I mentioned my friend Dottie at the beginning. And the question, you know, that's posed to me now when I think about who's here today and, and, and what you may be going through, you may not be a primary sufferer. Maybe you're a secondary sufferer. Maybe you've sustained a tremendous loss. Maybe you're going through something that where somebody else is suffering. Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Easter, great little book, um, concludes with a conversation with Professor Gary Habermas, who uh, has written extensively about the historical proofs for the resurrection. Now, nobody's going to think their way into believing, but the proofs are helpful. And at the end, he gives his own personal testimony when he shares a painful moment in his life as he watched his wife, Debbie, dying of cancer. And he said, as he sat on his, on his porch, he had a Job-like encounter with God. And he, and he said to him, Lord, why is Debbie up there in bed? 
and he felt like he heard the Lord say to him, Gary, did I raise my son from the dead? And he, and he, and he answers back, Lord, I've written books about this. I know that you rose your son from the dead, but I want to know about Debbie. And then the Lord's like, he said, kept asking him, did I raise my son from the dead? Did I raise my son from the dead? Now listen to his own words. He said, he kept asking me this question until I got the point. The resurrection says that if Jesus was raised 2,000 years ago, there's an answer to Debbie's death in 1995. Do you know what? It worked for me while I was sitting on the porch, and it still works today. It was a horribly emotional time for me, but I couldn't get around the fact that the resurrection is the answer for her suffering. Losing my wife was the most painful experience I've ever had to face, but if the resurrection could get me through that, it can get me through anything. It was good for AD 30, it was good for 1995, and it's good beyond that. He locked his eyes with mine. He says, that's not some sermon. I believe that with all my heart. If there's a resurrection, there's a heaven. If Jesus was raised, Debbie will be raised. I will be someday too. Then I'll see them both. You know, we who know the story can grow complacent about how life-defining this can be. We can go to spiritual Plasticville in our relationship with God, even if we've met him sometime in the past. And so what I want to do to, to conclude is to show you a three-minute video about an older couple who funded the Jesus film to a people group in Ethiopia. And after you watch this short little film, Glenn, I want you to see, I want you to watch the children's faces because they're, they're look, they're, it's like they're meeting Jesus, really, in this film. And then after, that, after we show you the clip, I'm just going to invite anybody here who'd like to encounter Jesus, perhaps for the first time, to do so. So let's see the clip and we'll be almost done. They're responding. So how about you? God loves you. Jesus died for you. He's calling your name. And the question is, will you turn in repentance from self-rule Nobody's going to run my life but me. From self-rule to his rule and trust him. You can receive Christ through prayer. It's just a simple way of expressing faith. And I want to invite you, those who've maybe never done this, to give your heart to God. And I'm going to offer a prayer that's something like I prayed, and if it expresses the desire of your heart, and you pray that prayer in your heart, kind of like I said in the Towson Diner, Lord, I give you my heart. Then I'm going to just ask, as we're with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, that if you pray that prayer, I'm just going to ask you to make eye contact with me. Just lift up your head, make eye contact with me, and then just put it down. Maybe, you know, maybe everybody here is a Christian. I don't know. But that's the way I'm going to be able to, to know if anybody's responding, and I'd love to talk with you after. And then after this, there's going to be a song, and then Ed and Laurie will provide another way of response for all of us to celebrate new life in Christ. So let's pray, please, every, every head bowed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here with us today, that you're our God. And I pray for those who need a fresh and a new encounter with you, more than just believing Bible stories, but truly encountering you. And so I offer this prayer and invite those who desire to know you deeply to pray it. Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my heart and receive you as Savior and Lord. I know I've been in control of my own life. And as a result, I've sinned against you. Come into my heart. Change my life. Forgive my sins. Make me your child. And make me the kind of person that you want me to be. So now with every head bowed, I just want to ask that if you prayed that prayer, just make some eye contact with me and then put your head back down. And then we'll continue. Lord, I thank you for those who desire you and trust you and are longing that that void be fulfilled. As we continue to worship, as we continue to respond today on this glorious day, make yourself known to us and assure us of these truths through Christ our Lord.